here comes the money. You're now listening to the Gambling with Gold podcast with Jason Gold. Presented by Champions Round. Welcome to Gambling with Gold. My name is Jason Gold. This is Dan Titus. We are here to preview the NFC East. Talking about Dan's Philly Birds. See if they can get it done in this division. This is Gambling with Gold, episode 96. Let's get into the odds in the NFC East right off the top. Dallas plus 140 to win the division. Philadelphia plus 160. Washington plus 500. And the Giants plus 800. The win totals for each team. Dallas is at 10 wins. Philadelphia at 9.5. Washington at 8. Giants at 7. Yes, no to make the playoffs. Uh, Dallas minus 230 to make the playoffs. Plus 195 not. Uh, Philly minus 190 to be in. Plus 150 no. Washington plus 150 to be in, minus 185, no. And Giants plus 230 to make it, minus 280 not to make it. A lot of stuff off the top that I like in this division, but I'll throw it over to you, someone that is intimately familiar with this division. Uh, What do you think about those odds? Yeah, it's hard not to play Homer in this division uh, because I'm a loyal. Play it! Play it! But, dude, I mean, already, like, months ago, I locked in the Eagles at eight and a half wins. But, like, this is back in May. I, I took them to win the division at plus 210 and Miles Sanders under six and a half rushing TDs. And I like the way the market's moving because there's been, you know, obviously this number has gotten a little bit shorter for the uh, for the Eagles. But I just don't understand where the books are at with the Dallas Cowboys. Uh, this is a team, to me, that screams regression coming off their first playoff appearance in three years. And I just really don't see where they got better. They lost Amari Cooper. They lost Lyle Collins. Um, you know, Dak mixed reviews last year. Ezekiel Elliott is another year older. I think this is where the division uh, really changes hands. And the Eagles have a distinct chance to really overtake the Cowboys here. So nine and a half wins. It's a bit rich for me for the Eagles. I don't want to go there. I loved it at eight and a half, but um, I still think they have a very good chance to win the division. So at plus at uh, plus one sixty, I think that there's still value there. Um, I think that the Giants are definitely going to take a step forward here. Um, I love their over two and a half divisional wins at plus one twenty. I think they're going to surprise in this division. The Washington Commanders. That's a team I just have no faith in. Man, Chase Young. He's not coming off the pup list. I think that's big for their defensive line. We already know with Chase with Carson Wentz at quarterback, what you have to look forward to. That man is garbage. Sam Howell might become the quarterback sooner rather than later. Um, the Antonio Gibson situation, you know, he's on special teams right now because he has fumbleitis. I don't think that that's going to be changing. That's going to be a uh, RB carousel throughout the season. Not much, m- not much faith in the Washington Commanders here. I think they finished last in the division. We see the Giants take a step forward, Cowboys take a step back, and the Birds take care of business and win this division. So I already have a lot of these bets along with you. I bet the birds at over eight and a half. Also, I bet them as high as I believe plus 195 or plus 200 to win the division. I'm just going to read off my bets off the top, according to the lines that we just gave out, just because I'm too, I'm too excited. So (laughs) Phil, I'm not going to go out. I'm going to give out lines that don't exist anymore because screw you guys. You guys should have gotten on on this earlier. It was very clear that the birds were the bet to make it eight and a half. I'll give you bets that I'll bet now. I would still bet the nine and a half. I don't care. So give me over nine and a half wins for the birds. Give me plus 160 on the money line. Give me make the playoffs for the birds minus 190. Love, Love that. It. Dallas. Under, there's still a couple under 10 and a halfs out there in the market. Mostly 10s. If you can find a 10 and a half. Love that. I think I would still touch under 10, but definitely not as confident there. Dallas to miss the playoffs. Love plus that. 195. Love that. I, I think there's a really good chance that they aren't in. Everything that you said is perfectly spot on. A couple other things that I have on Dallas. Plus 14 in turnovers last year. Guess what? Got to regress. That, sh- that shit's regressing. They, The defense is going to regress overall. Look, Michael Parsons is awesome. We've seen Trayvon Diggs just get absolutely smoked. I know that at one point we talked about the, the fact that you still like the Trayvon Diggs over interceptions prop. Mm-hmm. That's fine, but he's going to get torched. I don't like a lot of uh, other parts of that defense. Offensive line for this team has been a calling card for seemingly like seven or eight years at this point, and it is yep. completely decimated at this point. Their best, I mean, they still have Zach Martin and, and Smith, but Smith is, you know, he misses half 31 year anyway, years so. old, man. Like, I mean, they're not young. Exactly. Dak, I anticipate, will take a step forward this year from his first. Last year was good, not great. Off of that ankle injury, I think he'll be better in this form. No Amari Cooper. 
you're depending on Jalen Tolbert, who I love, who I'll talk about in a second, but Likewise. you need him and you need Michael Gallup to be healthy and you need Fahoko or whatever the hell his name is to step up. Like their offense, their skill position players aren't that great, especially compared to what the Eagles have done. Uh, we, we both don't believe in Ezekiel Elliott. We both don't believe that the Cowboys will actually lean in to giving the ball to Tony Pollard more. Don't like Mike McCarthy. Don't really love that coaching staff in general. There are a lot of issues in Dallas that I cannot get behind. And based on the fact that the steps that they've taken backwards and the steps that the Eagles have made to improve, I, I see no reason that the Eagles should not be the favorites in this division. So give me all of those bets. Mike McCarthy, first coach fired. If this shit goes south on the Cowboys <laughs> quick, Jerry Jones is going to yank Mike McCarthy the hell out of there. So I like, sure. a little, I like a little sprinkle on that one. Jalen Tolbert. Offensive Rookie of the Year. We've talked about it. He's going to have to step up and be this number two wide receiver. So just for, from an opportunity standpoint, I think that he has the upside in order to win this. Whether he has the talent or he's utilized the way that I think that he should be utilized, I don't know, but that's also worth a sprinkle. And then top two in the division, your personal favorite. I don't think that there's any way that Washington or the Giants is better than the Cowboys, despite what I've just said. So I think that Eagles won, Cowboys two at plus 300 is a nice little bet. And then my favorite team in this division, I think, to place bets on. I, I already have all these bets on Philly. But the Giants. sneaky team? No. The sneaky team that I really want to bet is the Washington Commanders. And I want to fade the under. shit out of them. Under, I under, wanna... under. <laughs> okay, so the fact that this line at DraftKings is eight wins for them is banana land. There is nothing, nothing that tells me that this team – should be an eight-win team this season. The fact that they're Not only good. minus 185 to miss the playoffs, I get the NFC is weak. The Washington Commanders will not make the playoffs this season. That 185 should be like minus 300. I do not understand that line at all. There's nothing that you can tell me about the way that Carson Wentz has proven that he's going to play. Anything about the Antonio Gibson situation, anything about a, a second playmaker behind Terry McLaurin, their offensive line I don't really trust, their defense, you're right, without Chase Young. They also were horrendous in the secondary last season so i i don't believe that also a couple schedule things with washington uh they face four teams this season off of mini buys and they have to go and play three short week road games that's seven games where they're going to be in the negative coming into it despite how good they're going to play negative travel negative rest that is not a good situation for a team that's already has some dicey situations so give me all of the oh last point on them fifth against the pass fifth worst against the pass in DVOA last season, and they did nothing to address it in the offseason. There is no way that you can convince me that the Washington Commanders are going to win eight games this season. Give me the under eight. Give me that minus 185. And potentially, I may be interested in doing a Eagles one, Dallas two, Giants three, Washington four yeah. uh, exact order finish. Uh, I don't know what the odds are on that, but I imagine that it would be pretty sizable given that there's two differences there. So that's kind of all the best that I'm looking at right now. In this division, what do you think about the commanders in general? And do you like that sort of angle? Love the angle because I'm I'm all for fading uh the Washington Commanders. I'm I'm out on Carson Wentz. You know, his uh passing yards is over 3,500. I took the under on that just a couple days ago. Um, I'm on them. I just I, I agree with everything you said. I just don't see where this team takes a step forward here. And to have eight and a half wins still be um, their win total is egregious. I just don't see Carson Wentz right now taking the reins and making this team anywhere close to a 500 team or even a playoff team. So even at minus 185, ton of juice, but I agree with you. That should be closer to, you know, minus 250, minus even 300, um, given the way this roster construction is laying, is played out and also um, just fading Carson Wentz and whatever that situation is. Taylor Heineke was not a winner last year. The receiving corpse, I mean, yeah, cool. You get Curtis Samuel back, but for how long? I saw Lance Thomas um, came off the pup list. I guess that kind of matters, but not really. I guess that he's a good blocking tight end, but also offers a little bit more in the receiving game. But I just don't know who is that second person outside of Terry McLaurin who got the bag that's going to step up for them. Uh, Jahan Dotson, their prize rookie, is probably going to go through some growing pains initially with Carson Wentz throwing the, at quarterback. So, yeah, I just think there's many reasons to – uh go against the, the Washington commanders this year, but wanted to add a couple other bets in there that uh, I've been evaluating. Uh, one was uh, the Eagles over three and a half divisional wins at plus plus one ten. I see a scenario where they beat the Washington commanders twice 
then mm-hmm. they would split between the Giants and the Cowboys. And um, I also like I, I'm going to sprinkle in comeback player of the year, Daniel Jones at eight to one, because this is a quarterback award. 14 of the last 21 winners have come from quarterbacks. And I think there's a very good chance with him, with Brian Dable, we could see this improved offensive line really benefit Dale, Daniel Jones. And I know that he's been one of the in the fantasy community. He's been one of the players that has kind of moved up in terms of ADP. If you're going to tank and, and avoid, you know, most of the quarterbacks in the top 10, top 12 there could be value in Daniel Jones because the giants have the most favorable schedule, according to uh, Warren Sharp's analysis um, with the Eagles coming at number two. So I think those are two things that I think go pretty underrated for the, this divisions that the Eagles and the, and the, uh, the giants have really favorable schedules that they could rack up some wins. And I'm also surprised. I know Kevon, I know Kevon Thibodeau got hurt uh, with that MCL injury. He's going to be missing three or four weeks, but But he's fine. He's not that fine. And so defensive player of the year, uh, defensive rookie of the year, excuse me, six to one. I think there's still value there, man. If this, if this Giants team climbs up, can get over seven, eight wins, I think there's a very good chance that his his play could, could certainly catapult them there. So I think there might be value on him at six to one, too. So I bet or in a, the FSGA props contest, we took Kayvon at plus 550 to win uh, defensive rookie of the year. A bet I still like. Seems like he's probably going to end up missing week one or close yeah. to it. So I actually think that you You may want to, yeah, you may want to wait. I I agree that he's a a great pick. I'm just from a value perspective. If he's at six now and he misses week one, you have to get a little bit more value, I would assume. So I'd probably wait until after week one, but I I do think he's going to be a huge difference maker. And Wink Martindale is going to absolutely unleash what he does best, which is rushing the passer, blitzing, coming from all different positions. And, you know, he's used to coming at, at Oregon. He did play off ball a little bit or off the line a little bit. So I think that you can use them in a couple of different positions and it would be interesting. Uh, so yeah, maybe, maybe wait to yeah. maybe wait till plus 700. Sorry. Totally agree. Yeah. Just going back to uh, the Giants. So you're fading the Washington commanders. Yep. I'm buying in a little bit to the Giants and, and them uh, making some improvements this year. One angle for the I don't want to touch their win total because I do have some questions of how this team may um, work through the work throughout the season. But I do think specifically in the NFC East, there is value on them at two and a half over two and a half divisional wins at plus one twenty, um, because I think that they could. I think that they're going to sweep the Washington Commanders, and if they don't, I think that they could take at least one victory out of each of the teams in the division. Um, but the Giants' win total, just for a stat per Bet Labs, the Giants under win total in five straight years. They've gone under their win total in five straight years in eight of their last nine since two thousand eleven. So. Just some caution there if you are a Giants homer like some people that work for Champions Round. <laughs> uh, shout out Steph. Uh, yes. Although she's turned into like she's a Giants lover, but also like a Giants hater at the same time, which is great. No, she's realistic um, now. She, she she gets it. But there's still some optimism here. I think the Giants are going to be better than people expect. I fully expect for the Giants offense to have some real flashes this year with Brian Dayball, who I absolutely love. I think the play calling is going to be great. The problem is, is that Dave Gettleman left this roster in such a pile of dirt that it's going to yeah. take Joe Shane a couple of years to be able to develop this roster into a position where they're capable of competing for the NFC East crown. So, yes, seven, seven I think seven and ten is probably right for them this season. So I probably wouldn't bet that either. But I do expect to see some some flashes and to have them pull off some nice upsets this season, kind of like they did against New Orleans last year. They had a couple flashes. I think they show even more uh, this season. We're oh strength of schedule for you mentioned it from Warren Sharp. Yeah. Dallas has the tenth easiest schedule. Philly the second easiest. Washington the sixth easiest, and the Giants the easiest. So for sure, an easy division uh, when it comes to playing outside of their division. Um, but Washington and Philly for sure, huge huge advantage here in terms of looking at their win totals. Uh, big question for every team. Dallas. I'm gonna start here. Offensive line, health, and defensive regression. What do you think is the biggest issue for the Cowboys this season? Uh, I think it's going to be de- defensive regression. You know, those that 14 turnover differential, I mean, that's so substantial. And it bailed them out quite a few times when their offense sputtered. So, um, actually, I might change that more so to – maybe it's Mike McCarthy because – I like your angle of betting him for for one of the first QBs to or one of the first coaches to uh, be fired. The dude doesn't have a history of of sustained performance. And, you know, one first two seasons, he was a pretty 
middle of the road type of type of coach without as much talent around these guys. I don't know where this team's going to go forward. So um, Michael Parsons certainly could be one of the best defensive players in the, in the NFL. If this team gets to 10 wins, I think he could be in the conversation for de defensive player of the year, but um, I just don't see their defense taking that next step um, at least to that level that they were last year. So I think that that regression there is certainly going to be their downfall um, this year. Cause I think, as you said, I think Dak, you know, he played coming off of an ankle injury. He's going to have to find his footing again. I think he'll be straight having a full off season to, to kind of get with it. So um, expecting big things out of CD lamb, but defense, I think is what's really going to be the, the pain point for him. Yeah. And for me, I, I'm torn between defensive regression and the offensive line, but you know, this kind of the, the team, like I mentioned it, they run through this offensive line that has been their focal point. And I think that they're going to be at a deficit this season. They're no longer a top 10 offensive line. Nope. And you're playing in a division where, you know, Philly has a top three, top five offensive line and one of the best defensive lines in football. I, and also the Eagles have traditionally, or at least the last couple of years have absolutely murdered the Cowboys. So I, I don't know. I, I would say the offensive line is probably the biggest issue for Dallas and something that they're going to have to overcome. And I don't know how you can overcome that mid-year. Yeah. And even looking at the Eagles secondary, I mean, they grabbed James Bradbury from the Giants. They got Darius Slay, who had a great season. Um, his first ones with the Eagles. So, yeah, I I think it's going to be a struggle for Dallas here, man. I, I don't if you can find those ten and a halfs out there, I, I would definitely be hammering that under as well. Uh, biggest question for the Eagles this season. Uh, I think it all comes down to Jalen Hurts. How good can he be as a quarterback inside the pocket? We know, you know, throwing outside the numbers where he can see his receivers, he's absolutely elite. He's a great runner. He's a good game manager, smart guy. But can he win from the pocket? Because I think that's what takes them from a 10-win team to a potential Super Bowl contender if he's able to do that. I think you're right. This season pretty much hinges on the play of Jalen Hurts. There's whispers of if he, this isn't the year for him, they'll go out and get a quarterback next year. Um, but I think that all indications are they're they're locked in and, and trying to make this guy succeed. You go out and acquire A.J. Brown. I think Devontae Smith is going to have a great season as that number two. You have Dallas Goddard that actually has no competition for for some for a change, you know, without Zach Ertz there. Um, and I think that there's a possibility that they could trade for Kareem Hunt. I don't I don't know that that's yep. actively in the works, but. I think it it aligns for what they need right now with Miles Sanders currently nursing a hamstring injury. He's been prone to miss injury to miss games. Kenneth Gainwell was selected by Nick Sirianni in year one. So I think we'll see him kind of emerge there in Boston Scott, but they're not Kareem Hunt. So if you really want to commit to this team winning, you go out and get a running back that wants to be traded. And I think Kareem Hunt would would fit perfectly in this offense. Um, but yeah, you, you you talked about it. I think that the as great as much as their offensive line grades out, they are kind of old. Um, mm -hmm. so I have some concerns there about whether they can actually, uh, make it through a full season without any, without having to go into the backups, but, um, I'm really excited about the defense and I haven't been excited about an Eagles defense in a long time. I think that's been a, uh, that's been a struggle for them to, to find consistency, especially at the linebacker position. But I think the defensive line can actually get some pressure this year, which is one thing they didn't do last year. So, um, homerness aside, I think that this team could be, should be better this year and Jalen hurts. If he can actually throw the ball and not have to change completely change the script from, hey, we're going to pass the ball first half of the season. Hey, you can't pass the ball. We need to run it. If we can actually keep defenses honest, defenses honest with his quarterback play, that's what changes the game for them. Uh, give me that Kareem Hunt for Jalen Rager and a fifth-round pick deal tomorrow Woo! for both Jaylen, sides. Rager, it's been real. No, it hasn't. Like You're, you're out, dude. Like I'll, I'll ship you a bunch of people, too. We got a couple of scrubs on the roster that could, could definitely be uh, – moved on but i think it makes sense actually with uh, a move to the browns because they could use some receiving help yeah absolutely i think that deal makes a lot of sense for a couple of different reasons uh washington i guess my biggest question for them is well i guess the first part is we thought that coming into the 2021 season that that defense was going to be elite they, we thought that they would be probably a top five top 10 unit and they did not perform no. at all the 2020 season they were grading out at the end of the season as being near an elite defense can they get back to it this season I don't think so. And then that puts pressure on the offense and the offense is already seemingly in turmoil. So if this defense can't step up and be a top 10 unit, this team's completely screwed. Yeah. And it doesn't help that, uh, as I mentioned before, Chase Young is not off the pup list. So he could miss potentially the first four, anywhere from four to six games to start the season. And you need that edge rusher to kind of put pressure on the quarterback. Um, 
you just haven't really seen much out of the the commanders to instill confidence in them and yeah I, i'm just fading i'm i'm on team fade them so <laughs> there's not much more we can i we can add to it like there's just so many holes and concerns at multiple positions throughout this roster that i just can't get behind them all right uh last one the giants i think my biggest question and everyone's biggest question is can brian dayball unlock whatever is inside daniel jones as a professional quarterback and then can they sustain the injuries because the roster like we mentioned pretty terrible if their first stringers go down big issues um but you know injuries are always a question i think this really comes down to what can dayball do with dj and if and nothing just tyrod come in and is tyrod capable of you know having them have a seven win season uh tyrod's always been like a solid bridge quarterback um understands very cerebral quarterback he does enough to win games so you know if daniel jones can't cut it I think Tyrod would definitely be uh and this is not standing again because you see there's a little Vic jersey down there. I, I know Ty, Tyrod Taylor well from my my hokey days, but um yeah, I just think he's a solid backup for for one to have. And um I like what the Giants did on offense. I, I think Kenny Galladay is, is definitely a thing of the past, man. I don't know how I mean he got the bag and he just went to to, to complete dog shit. So but I like that they've moved on past that. You got one Dale Robinson, you have um uh, Kadarius Tony, both two very good explosive players that have an expanded route tree that can get into open space and take it to the house. So I think that's going to be really helpful for Daniel Jones to have some downfield threats that can actually um, create separation and find find angles in space. But it's really on Saquon, man. Um, this offensive line could not move anything last year, and so much so that you know it's pretty much just Saquon in the flats that that was that was his value. Um, they're going to need to run the ball a little bit, but I think getting Evan Neal was certainly an upgrade for their offensive line. Um, they'll be better. So how much better? I, I think that they will at least get to, you know, as we stated earlier, seven wins. That seems achievable with this current roster construction, assuming everyone's healthy. And it's hard to really predict injuries, but, you know, I think this is probably the most protection Saquon's had and Daniel Jones have had in their careers. So um, that's a good starting point. Yeah, my question with Brian Dayball's offense and Saquon, and I think that Saquon, if healthy, will have a great season. But in terms of being like a number one fantasy guy, yeah. do we have any concerns that Brian Dayball's offense doesn't really feature running backs very much? Uh, it was it's yeah. designed is designed to open up the passing game. Certainly did at Buffalo. If you go sure. back to his time at Alabama, you know it was really spread it out, throw it out deep, throw it to the playmakers. This is not really like a oh we're going to give the ball to Saquon twenty five times a game. I don't know. And it's not really a dump off offense either. Now it might be because Daniel Jones is Daniel Jones. So he might just have to get rid of the ball without having to actually scan the field. Um, but I, I'm, I think I'm higher on Saquon's reception upside and passing game upside than I am on his actual running game being successful this season. Yeah. I think it's fair to argue that Saquon isn't a 20. I don't, I don't know if he's a, he's a third down back because of his reception because of his hands, but I don't think he's going to be getting the ball between the tackles 20 plus times a game. They signed, uh, was it Matt Breida, I believe, yep. as his backup. And then they also have, um, uh, what's the last? I picked him Gary, on my dynasty team. They have Gary Brightwell from uh, Yes, Arizona. from uh, yeah. Black- University of Arizona, I think. Yes, I was thinking of, I was thinking of Blackshear from uh, the Buffalo, <laughs> uh, Buffalo Bills. Um, but yeah, so they have depth behind him for once. So I don't think that there's a need to pound him between the tackles and potentially risk injury. Um, but I think you're right. The value in Saquon is his ability to catch the ball. And, you know, his rookie season, he had like, what, 90 receptions or something yeah. like that. Crazy. So, you know, he's an explosive player with the ball in his hands. But I think the upside with with Daniel Jones in this offense is his mobility. And we saw with Josh Allen what that did to unlock him and 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 having to account for another another angle that maybe they didn't offer before under Joe Judge. Um, I think that they're going to find ways for him to be successful, get the ball out find the playmakers in space and and make more things happen offensively. So I'm excited about Dable coming over here. I think that that's going to be an upgrade for them. Um, I do have question marks on their defensive side of the ball, um, but if they can put points on the board in this division, um, it should go well for them, at least better than it was in the years past. All right. Three final questions to close out the NFC East divisional gambling preview podcast. Number one, Fantasy guy to watch for in the division, maybe someone that you know you're not drafting in the first two or three rounds that could really, uh, you know, have a great season. I think Wondell Robinson. I think is is fair. I think he's a deep guy that you may not have to draft in twelve team leagues. He might be on the waivers, but um, Kadarius Tony couldn't stay healthy last year. 
I like what I've seen so far in the preseason from him and the reports in practice. Like this guy is a playmaker. Um, I, I think that there's targets to be had in this offense. And I don't know that an alpha has really been established yet. So you might be able to get him on the cheap. Um, and I saw he was going very late in Scott Fishbowl drafts. So um, that's a guy I'd be, I'd be eyeing in late in late as a late round target in drafts. My answer is very similar, but it's the guy that you said well, didn't say healthy last year. It's Kadarius Tony. Yeah, yeah, I think I for the exact same reason. I think there's a lot of targets available. We think it's going to be a, a pass heavy offense, similar to what we saw in Buffalo, and they don't have a number one. And we don't believe in you know Sterling Shepard or Kenny Galladay to be that guy. So uh, for yeah. the very similar reason. And we saw you know when Tony was healthy this last season, guy was a stud. He's a playmaker. So I think that they'll what? be very creative in trying to find ways to utilize him. But I do believe that Wandale Robinson will also be heavily involved and could be an interesting fantasy piece. And then we've been closing out every podcast with division, divisional MVP and divisional LVP. I'll give you the floor on the uh, MVP here. I know who it is, but that's okay. So LVP, MVP, I think is going to be Hertz. I yep. think, I think it's going to have a great season and um, you know, I want to invest. I mean, I, I'd be willing to pull, you know, fourth, fifth round for Jalen Hurts. That's what's going to cost this year um, for his rushing upside. And the fact that, you know, he's actually has a, a true alpha in, in AJ, AJ Brown. There's some rapport there. I think he's going to have a monster fantasy season. Could be QB one by the, when it's all said and done. Um, average over 20 fantasy points and he even had bad games when he wasn't throwing the ball. So just so much rushing upside there. LVP. <laughs> It's hard to decipher between Carson and Antonio Gibson. I'm going to go with Carson because I don't think he's going to hold the job all year. He's not even a fantasy. I mean, I don't think anyone would be rightfully drafting him in anything between 12 and 14 formats. He's probably going to be in that no man's land of streamable, but he's going to be hot garbage. So maybe I should give someone that's actually going to be a fantasy player, which is Antonio Gibson. Um, I understand buying the dip, but how low can you go with this? I think it's real that Brian Robinson might steal some red zone work from him. And, you know, Ron Rivera is, is known for having two back systems. And if you go all the way back to the Jonathan Stewart, D'Angelo Williams, you know, Deshaun Foster, all that, all those days always had multiple wow, running Deshaun backs. Deshaun Foster, let's go. <laughs> all the, They always had multiple running backs. So, you know, I think that they went out and got Brian Robinson for a reason. This guy's low tread on his tires. I think there are some questions on can he handle a real workload? Well, he's going to be the short yardage guy. And it's clear that Antonio Gibson can't hold on to the ball. And let's not forget Antonio Gibson was compared to CMC in, dra in his draft comps because of his receiving ability. Mm -hmm. Antonio Gibson may not be dead. He just may not be the running the workhorse back that everyone thought he could be like a, a CMC. He's going to be used in the pass game and they need it because they don't have another guy that they can rely on outside of Terry McLaurin that I've seen. So mm -hmm. I think there's still some value in drafting Gibson. I just don't think he's going to reach his ADP. Well, his ADP is falling now, but so the value where you get him might, di might differ, but I think in home leagues, there's going to be some people that still aren't paying attention and draft Antonio Gibson super high, just based off of his 10 touchdowns last year. Yeah. My MVP for the division is going to be Jalen Hurts also for the exact same reason. LVP I I'm torn. So you took Gibson. I think it's a good call. I do think that Brian Robinson is going to end up starting at some point this season, it could be really early. Gibson had three. Wow. Yeah. That's, I think that's he will. a hot take of sorts. I think he will be. I, every report is that Gibson's on the out. He's playing special teams. He's fumbling all the time. Like you could say that Rivera's punishing him and trying to get him to learn something. But as soon as he goes in the game of the season and fumbles once or twice, it's right. Brian Robinson's job. So I think yeah. it'll happen pretty early in the season. Um, Gibson had 300 touches last season. Like he's going to have less than 200 this season. He went 240, 300 this year. I, I think it's going to be like 180. Like, so I, I wouldn't touch him at it even as ADP is dropping. Uh, I would draft Brian Robinson if you can get ahead of that one. But, right. you know, in any sort of sharp league, I think that people are probably picking him up pretty early. Uh, so I'll, I'll avoid that LVP. I'll go with, you know what? I'm going to stick it running back. I'll go Zeke. I think this is the year the wheels sure. finally completely fall off. And I think it's, I, you know, it, it might not even be because Zeke's old or whatever. I don't trust the offensive line. And he's too slow and too old to make plays on his own. Tony Pollard is a little bit different story. But Zeke in that backfield without that sort of offensive line, look, he might score nine touchdowns just because he gets, you know, 4,000 carries at the one-yard line. Fine. I, I get it. But he's going to end up costing them games because of his inability to make moves out of the backfield. So uh, I would say LVP is going to be Zeke Elliott.
I think I that agree. does it. I think that does it. Uh, thank you for listening to Gambling with Gold, episode 96, the NFC East Divisional Gambling Preview. We will be back very shortly with our AFC North Divisional Gambling Preview. Stay tuned for that. Until then, good luck with on all of your best this season. Dan, thank you for joining me. We will talk to you guys soon. See you.